and gentlemen, Gary Moore. Splendid looking audience, and who knows, this may mean a screen contract for any one of you sitting out there. We want to welcome you to our show, and I'm sure that such phrases as blow me down and shiver my timbers and I am disgusted are part of the language of the spinach-eating sailor man known as Popeye. Well, our first guest today is the voice of Popeye, and we'll meet him right after we say hello to our popular panel here on To Tell the Truth, Gene Rayburn. Peggy Cat. Bill Cummins. And Kitty Carmile. Panel, if you were like me, you're a fan of short subjects and cartoons and oh, yeah. stuff like that. And I want you to feast your eyes on your monitors for some film of Popeye the Sailor. Now, first, let me set the scene here. It says, Popeye and Olive Oil have landed on the moon, and they've been put in jail by the head cheese man. He's the villain. <laughs> uh, now, that dastardly villain has just ordered a poor cheese taxpayer to be tortured by being dipped in hot mustard. <laughs> now, this vile act is more than Popeye can tolerate, so watch the film. A pretty cheesy trick to play on them little fellas. I'm the big cheese around here, and what I say goes. Oh, yeah. the man who has the voice of Popeye. Number one, what is your name, please? My name is Jack Mercer. Number two. My name is Jack Mercer. Number three. My name is Jack Mercer. And your job as usual panel is to find out which one truly is Jack Mercer and listen to his Popeye prose goes like this. It says, I, Jack Mercer, am the voice of Popeye the Sailor Man. As a newspaper comic strip character, Popeye made his debut in 1929. Soon afterward, however, he could be seen in animated film cartoons. Most of you will remember with affection those scenes in which our heroes slugged it out with the menacing blue toe for the affections of olive oil. In addition to talking like Popeye, I also do the voices of many of his friends including his four nephews, Poop Deck Pappy, and his hamburger-eating honcho, Jay Wellington Wimpy. In addition, I was the sole voice man for all of the characters in 240 cartoons of Felix the Cat. Signed, Jack Mercer. And while our three Popeyes get settled in and get their spinach, we'll have a wait for my sponsor. Little man. Our gentleman across the way claimed to be Jack Mercer, the voice of Popeye and numerous other cartoon characters. And for no reason at all, we'll start with Peggy Cat. Thank you. Hey, number one, you know, you look like Barry Goldwater. Thank you. <laughs> uh, number one, um, did you do the feature film uh, that has been recently released of Felix the Cat? 
No, I did not. Oh. Uh, number two, how many Popeye films have you done? Well, about uh, 454. Well, and how many do they... Uh, do they still do Popeye's? Uh, no, they don't. Oh. Number three, when did they stop making Popeye? Oh, just recently, about a year ago. Well, where were they showing them? In, 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 in movie theaters or on television? Both. Uh-huh. Uh, number one, who animated Popeye? What studio? Uh, Max Fleischer, and then Paramount took over. And number two, what did Bluto look like? Well, it was a big, heavy set fellow with a beard. Oh, yes. Very rough. Uh-huh. Oh. And, uh... <coughs> Thank you. And we're going to go to uh, Bill Cullen. Number two, uh, where did you do the voiceovers for these cartoons? In uh, New York. And, and number one, how did they find you? How, how did you end up getting a job like this? What were you doing before, for instance? I was working in the studio, and I started to imitate Popeye. Uh, imitate? Uh, I'll go along with you, number three. How did you get the job? Working in the studio until that started. And, and uh, did someone come up to you and say, how would you like to be the voice of Popeye from here on in? That's right. What, number two, were you also working in the studio before? Yeah. What were you What were you doing before you got the job doing Popeye's voice? I was an uh, in betweener. Between? Oh, you were an actor, in other words? No, an in betweener. I drew drawings in between the extreme drawings that the animators made. And, that, and they call that an in betweener. Phrase yeah. I never heard. Let's go to Kitty. Oh. And number one, were you an in betweener? No, ma'am. I was a cartoonist. But you gave it up to do these voiceovers. That's right. Uh, did you regret it? No, I loved it. Ah, uh, number two. You know, all the spinach Popeye eats, um, recently they've discovered that all spinach isn't very good for you. Did you know that? Uh, I heard that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't upset you? Uh, not at all, no. Uh, number three, was it because of Wimpy, the, uh, the fellow that ate all the, the hamburgers, that they have Wimpy's in, in London? That's right. And do you get a royalty from that? No, I don't. How come? Just didn't happen. Oh, well, number two, you didn't draw Popeye, is that right? Uh, only for the stories. So do you I... get a royalty? You didn't get a royalty because you didn't name him Wimpy. Uh, no. Uh, who drew it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. And uh, we're going down to Gene Rayburn. Yes, sir. Number one, uh, do you get residuals? Yes, sir, I do. And number two, uh, what do you think the appeal of Popeye is? It, it, the Popeye's following has been enormous through the years, not only in newspapers but in films. So what's the basic appeal of Popeye? Well, I don't know. I think it's because he's uh, strong and uh, he's uh, got a, a lot of morals. Yeah, and, okay. Uh, he wants to see that the other guy gets his, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number three. When you work, do you do the voice track first and then they match the cartoon to it? Or do you watch the cartoon no, and match it? No, they your... do the picture first and then the voice follows. And you, you sit in a room and you watch a screen? Is that the way it goes? No, right. And how many voices... Hey, we just got ourselves a little bell there. And that means no more questioning. It is balloting time. And the audience will now mark our mental ballots for number one, or number two, or number three. As usual, we pay $50 for each wrong vote. We pay $500 if the panel is totally incorrect. And Peggy Starr. Thank you. Well, number one looks like Barry Goldwater. Mm -hmm. what, what does that matter? It's going to be a voice of Popeye. <laughs> and number two, you were really funny, and I thought you had a sort of a timbre in your voice, it might be. But number three, I don't know, I just think it's number three. He's got that, he was very laconic, like Popeye. All right, so we got a three going. Bill Cullen, you agree? Well, I, I, for some reason, I thought it was number three, too. And I thought, no, because if anyone who does it is an actor and an outgoing and number three. Anyway, I ended up for the most outgoing of all I thought, voting for number two. All right. I was confused. So far, right. going down the line, a three and a two and a Kitty Carlisle. Well, you see, number two has the quality of voice for it. And number one had the quality when he said his name, sort of. But if you've got to do all kinds of voices, you can't have a very gravelly voice if you're going to do olive oil and all those lady characters. So I voted for number three, who seems to have the most... Uh, uh, Versatile? Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. All righty, so we got a pair of threes and a two, Gene Rayburn. Well, number one appeared to me to be deliberately trying to change his voice uh -huh. and speak in a higher register. Mm -hmm. And so I figured he was once trying to disguise that gravelly, low pitch quality, and I voted for him for that reason. All right. <coughs> so we've got a one and a two and a pair of threes. The votes are all in. Will the real Jack Mercer please stand up? 
Hey, 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 Good job, gentlemen. We were worried as to whether or not something of the voice would creep through there, and it worked out beautifully. Number one, Mr. Goldwater. <laughs> Will you tell us what your real name is and what you do? Use your real voice. Uh, my name is Daniel Higgins. <laughs> that is his real voice. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do, Mr. Higgins? I'm a retired uh, U.S. Army major, and at the present time, I'm plant manager of the South Amboy, New Jersey plant of Positive Chemicals Incorporated. Now, Good. Here it is. <laughs> Number three, we'd like to know about you. Well, my name is John Black. Yes. I have had, I've uh, been in the travel business or agency business for, uh, since 1945. Expect to, and hopefully open my own business in the Exxon business, uh, building very shortly. Hey, good luck to you. Well, Jack, the audience would kill me if I let you get away without giving us some small demonstration of Popeye. Just anything that you'd care to do. I'd be glad to. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. I'm strong to the finish because I eat me spinach. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. Whoa, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> I not only enjoyed this fight, I found a new name for myself and what I do on this show. What? I'm an in-betweener. Between you and them. But now, we turn quite serious. We have all read the statistics to prove that women live longer than men. Uh, inevitably, the result of this is that every year, 100,000 women become widows. Now, in this country, there are approximately 9 million widows, and our next guest has made a study of this group of women. It's a serious subject and a serious problem, and uh, I would advise you to stay tuned. Now, let's meet our authority on the problems of widowhood. <laughs> Number one, what is your name, please? My name is Helena Lopata. Number two. My name is Helena Lopata. Number three. My name is Helena Lopata. And let us listen to the story of Helena Lopata. She says, I, Helena Lopata, am a professor of sociology. In my book called Widowhood in an American City, I tell of the forgotten victims of modern technology and progress, the American widows. Science has prolonged their lives beyond that of their husbands, who are frequently victims of the hectic pace of urban life. In other cultures, the role of the widow is well defined. However, in the United States, widowhood affects women differently depending on their individual circumstances. The problems of widowhood include grief, loneliness, the management of money, and the single-handed guidance of children. Nonetheless, the picture is not all bleak. Contrary to popular opinion, widows prefer not to live with their children, and they are not all anxious to marry again, and after the grieving period, they can even enjoy their newfound freedom and independence. Signed, Helena Lopata. And Jean Rayburn, I will turn the three professors over to you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, number two, uh, the statistics, uh, you say, indicate that men die sooner than women. And w what are the age statistics, statistics on that? The men die much earlier than the women, uh, and usually on the job. I see. Okay. <laughs> number three, why is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are a lot of different reasons. Women used to die, die in childbirth, and now we have gotten rid of contagious disease, diseases in childbirth as causes for death, why the men's death rate from such things as cancer and heart have not decreased. Well, no, uh, number one, uh, maybe you can help me here. Why do the women live longer than men? Well, the heart attack rate is much higher in, among men than women, 
It's a practically four to one. Uh, now, wait, wait, no, wait a minute, number one. <laughs> I know that. Jack! Exactly. Well, I'm glad to thank you. That. And the buzzer just rang, and we're going to go take They die younger than we do because we're more perfect people. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> number Everybody says so. Number one, uh, how long does a period of deep grief last for... I think it varies with a type of widow, uh, depending on her uh, social background, educational back background, financial standing. Well, you know, number two, uh, it, it says in the affidavit that you, uh, that widows prefer not to live with their children, but surely that only means widows with grown-up children. If they've got children and they're little children, they can't just throw them out. I'm a widow, get out of here. Oh, with little children, they do have to stay with them. And well, number two, the problem that a widow would have with little children is hardly different, really, than the problem a divorced woman would have with little exactly. children. Exactly. Correct. And as a matter of fact, a, a, n n number three, do many, are most widows in this country left provided for, you know, monetarily, or do they have to go to work? Most of them live on the border of poverty. Number three, where do you see folks? I'm sorry, again, we're going to uh, Bill Cullen. Number one. Why do widows need this help, uh, in your estimation? Is it they have been too sheltered while they were married and all of a sudden find themselves without the strength nearby? I didn't mean to answer your question. Uh, I'll repeat it. Why do they need this help? Well, many widows are not prepared for... Most widows, really, are not prepared for widowhood, and they are very hard hit with the situation of widowhood. Are there cases, number three, where a woman who suddenly finds herself widowed finds that during their life together she really knew very little about her husband's business affairs, for instance. Most of the women who don't know much about their husbands are on the lower socioeconomic level and where they live separate lives. See, he, he in his world and she in her world. But as far as business affairs, yes, even the middle class one. Number two, you mentioned that the women... And uh, that takes us to Kitty Carlisle. Let us turn to the more constructive side. Uh, how can widows enjoy their newfound freedom and independence? Number three. By restructuring their identity and social life. And number two, how do they do that? By going out and getting a job, by meeting people, going to different organizations. Uh, number one, supposing they're not trained for anything, what are they supposed to do? Well, these women are really the hardest hit. In other words, they do not adjust, and they have the worst time of uh, being a, a widow. In other words, number three, you feel that a woman should really, somewhere in the back of her mind, prepare for being a widow, <laughs> and therefore learn a trade or do something constructive in terms of education. I think since women are going to live, are living 70 years of age, we should do it right from the beginning. That's what I mean. Number two, do you think they should... Hey there, friends. Sorry about that, but we get to ask no more questions. We've learned a lot, though, I think, and on that basis, let's mark our ballots for Professor number one, or Professor number two, or Professor number three. And, Gene Rayburn, have you arrived at a decision? Yes, I have arrived at a decision, and yeah. because none of them would answer my question, I didn't vote for any of them. <laughs> Listen, your life expectancy, don't get smart. Write a number down there. I wrote a number down, arbitrarily number three. She looks like she has the discipline to be a college professor. Very well. So we've got a three showing, and Peggy. Well, I thought number three certainly had the discipline to be a college professor, and I thought number one was Tommy, the only person who gave any real answers to me about how to look at, which is to go and get a job and to join organizations, and that is the right way to do it. If you're all alone, you've got to start again. That's the way to do it. Number two, you're a very sound person. Thank you. So, I'm going to vote for you, Peggy. <laughs> Very good reason. Home and let's, go, let's go to Bill Cullen. I voted for number three, and I can't tell you why, because there's no time left. That's why. <laughs> and so there isn't, so can he? For the same reason. <laughs> number three. All right, the votes are in. Will the real Professor Helena Lopata please stand up? Can <laughs> Well, it's a good try. Now, <laughs> Professor Lapata, let's find out who your friends are. Number one, what is your real name, please, and what do you I'm do? I'm Josephine Harris, and I'm a commercial artist. Commercial artist. Nice to have you. Number two, tell us about yourself. I'm Dilly Moore, and I'm a medical technician. Well, no. 
Professor Lopata, we didn't learn where this study was done and at what university you are a professor. I'm at Loyola University in Chicago, Loyola. and the study was done of widows 50 years of age or over living in metropolitan Chicago. Most of them are pretty poor. Okay, well, it's been most instructive, and thank you very much, Professor Lopata and ladies, for being with us on To Tell the Truth. You cherish this video collection based on the novels of Daniel Steele. Your first we were talking uh, during that last spot about how women should prepare themselves for widowhood uh, and uh, learn how to do something uh, for interest, if not for money. And I think you should start even before that. I remember in the case in our family, we have two sons. And my wife and I discussed the fact that some day was going to arrive when the kids would be up and out of the nest. And that of all she knew at that time when they left was, was motherhood, uh, that she was going to be pretty lonely. And so uh, she was a marvelous interior decorator in our own home. And so she went and took a course in interior decoration. And when the kids did grow up and leave the nest, she became a very successful interior decorator. So much so to the point where I began to get, so I had to make appointments to see her. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said to her, forget it and cut it out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the charming husband that I am. Good to you, friend. <laughs> Our central characters today will receive these fine classic Zero shirts featuring the new first button-down color in the distinctive collection of colors and patterns from Zero Shirt Magic. Promotional consideration provided by Bed Western Motels, the nation's largest chain of 1,250 fine owner-operated motels in 900 cities throughout the United States, Canada, and Mexico. This is Bill Wendell speaking for it to tell the truth. A mark of Bill Bill Cotton production. <laughs>